Okay, so in Attack on Titan, the one moment that changed everything was when Levi gave Armin the Colossal Titan. If the captain had chosen to save Irvin instead, then the whole timeline obviously would have been way different, and today we're about to explore how the rumbling would have ended in this alternate reality. By the way, in case you're new to the channel, you should probably know that this video is the final part of a 7 part series, so if you want to catch up on everything so far, then all you need to do is click the link on screen. For everyone else, I'd appreciate if you smash that sub button if you've enjoyed the story so far, and don't forget to stick around till the end if you want to see which characters actually survive. Alright, so the best place to start this video off is with Mikasa, who will slowly be waking up as the sun begins to set. In this moment, the last thing she'd remember is Flock trying to blow her up in Liberio, but strangely, she wouldn't have a single memory of anything that happened afterwards. As she then gradually opens her eyes, she noticed Eren quietly standing ahead of her, and based on their surroundings, it'd be clear that somehow they've made it back to Shiganshina. This realization would cause a million questions to start going through Mikasa's head, but before she has time to even form a complete sentence, Eren would begin to say something. Looking towards the sunset, he'd tell her that he's glad she's finally conscious, since he's been standing in this exact spot for weeks, waiting for her to recover. The reason they came to this specific location is because it's the same hill where they always used to play as kids, and he thought that being here might subconsciously help her to wake up. However, with no recollection of even travelling to Paradise in the first place, she'd respond by just asking him how exactly they arrived back home. Immediately, that question would cause him to go silent, and he'd keep facing off into the distance, almost like he's afraid to look at her. His unusual behaviour would definitely give Mikasa a slightly uneasy feeling by this point, and as she repeats the question, she'd also ask whether Levi and Historia are okay. This would be followed by an even longer awkward silence, but after a while, Eren would reluctantly have to turn around. The depressing look on his face would instantly let her know that something's wrong, but to explain why he's upset, we first need to understand the truth about what happened in Liberio. As we already know, Flock believed that the Ackermans were the only ones who could kill Eren, and so to stop them from interfering with the rumbling, he detonated the Armored Titan. The blast was so powerful that any regular human would have been vaporized, but for Levi, Mikasa and Historia, they were still alive as they fell towards the ground. During that long 70 meter drop, Irvin tried his best to catch their unconscious bodies, but the slowness of his titan meant that he was too far away to reach them in time. Meanwhile, Eren's vision was partially clouded by all the smoke coming from the rumbling, meaning he didn't properly see the Ackermans until they'd nearly hit the floor. By then, it was way too late to intervene, and so, in a moment of desperation, he brought Mikasa to the Path's dimension, which, as you probably guessed, is where they are right now. In Path, he spent weeks waiting for her to recover, and as her body was being rebuilt, Eren tried to think of different ways to save her in the real world. For example, one of his ideas was to transform her into a pure titan to increase her chances of survival, but he had to give up on that plan and several other plans due to Ackermans being unaffected by the founding titan. In the end, after considering basically every possibility, Eren realized that he was once again powerless to save the person he loves. When he was 10 years old, the same thing happened when he couldn't save his mother from being eaten, and then it happened again when Eren was brought back to life instead of Armin. On both occasions, Eren could only watch as his family were taken away from him, but what's especially tragic now is that he still can't prevent it even with his godlike abilities. After explaining all of this to Mikasa, she'd understandably be horrified and super confused. In her mind, the idea that her real body is seconds away from death while her consciousness has been in the past dimension for weeks is something that would be hard for any human to process. Eren would try to calm the situation by reassuring her that none of this was her fault, and he'd tell her that he never would have activated the rumbling if he'd known that this would be part of the future. Just like in the main timeline, he wouldn't have seen everything, and so this whole situation would genuinely be catching him by surprise. He'd go on to confess that ever since Armin's death, he's been paranoid about losing her, and that every choice he's made, including the rumbling itself, it was to guarantee that she'd be able to live a long life. Remember, Eren has known for years that the curse of Ymir was going to kill him one day, and so his goal was to die knowing that Mikasa and the people he cares about would be safe no matter what. Getting emotional, she'd reply by letting him know that she understands, because from the day he gave her that scarf, she's kind of basically felt the same way. We've seen before that Mikasa's biggest fear is Eren dying, and it's why she always puts everything on the line to save him regardless of how dangerous it happens to be. It could be argued that this overprotectiveness is the main way she expresses her love for him, considering that she's never been explicitly romantic, but in their last moment together, Eren would finally take the hint as he gives her a kiss. This goodbye smooch is something he'd probably been wanting to do for about 5 years, 
and he'd hoped that by doing it now, it'll allow Mikasa to pass away without any regrets. During the middle of the kiss, the surrounding environment would then suddenly collapse, reverting into the typical blue pass dimension that we're used to seeing. Seconds later, Mikasa would then disappear completely into the void, but what might surprise you is that even with Mikasa being gone, Eren wouldn't be alone in this dimension. Off in the distance, there'd be someone behind him seemingly tied to a cross, and on closer inspection, the person would turn out to be none other than Flock. For weeks, the Armor Titan has been trapped here in this position, with no way to move his body, no one to talk to, and no idea how he arrived in parts. Although I think he would have tried to stay strong in the beginning, by now the isolation would have mentally broken him down to the point where he'd just be desperate to escape by any means necessary. That's why when Eren unexpectedly appears in front of him, he'd call out to him for help as if the two of them are somehow still friends. Having just seen Mikasa vanish because of what Flock did, Eren would angrily turn around, grab him by the neck, and start screaming at him about why he blew himself up. The armor titan would try to defend himself by arguing that he didn't have a choice because the scouts were prepared to kill Eren to stop the rumbling. In particular, he'd highlight the details of Ervin's conversation with Willy Tiber, and he'd point out that the Ackermans are immune from the founding titan's power. This immunity, combined with their insane combat skills, meant that only Levi or Mikasa would be capable of killing the founder. That being said, Eren would fight back by telling Flock that Mikasa would never try to kill him, but even if she did, he'd still want her to have a long and happy life. After all, having already seen Armin be sacrificed for the greater good of the island, Eren would openly question why everyone he loves has to die in order for Eldia to be free. Flock would simply respond by reminding him that not everyone he cares about is gone. In fact, Connie is back home on the island and doing better than ever after being reunited with Mrs. Springer. This reunion was only possible because Eren kept relentlessly fighting over the years, and so the Armor Titan would urge him to finish what he started so that Connie and Sasha can have the peaceful lives that Eren wanted them to have. Interestingly, in spite of everything Flock has done, I think his words would resonate with Eren because it would remind him that there are still people back home that he needs to protect. If he was going to stop the rumbling now, then it would put all those same people in danger because the Global Alliance will retaliate whether it's in 10 years time or even 50 years time. For that reason, following an extremely long pause, Eren would accept that for the sake of his remaining friends, he does need to finish what he started, but just because he agrees with Flock wouldn't mean that he forgives him. Grabbing him by the shirt one more time, Eren would describe in detail how he's going to make Flock suffer and die in the worst way imaginable, and with that they'd be transported back into the real world. In this reality, only a handful of seconds would have passed since the armor titan exploded, meaning the scouts would still be falling through the smoke. With no one able to save them, their bodies would crash into the ground at full speed, instantly killing both Ackermans and creating a powerful shockwave that could be felt across Liberia. As a side note, given that Historia is a titan shifter, I highly doubt she'd die from the impact as well, but it'd make sense for her to at least be knocked unconscious. Now, when it comes to Commander Ervin, it's the fact that in 99% of situations, the death of two scouts wouldn't really affect him. Throughout the series, there are countless examples of him either disregarding or gambling with people's lives, and it's why Flock referred to him as the devil himself. The commander has also been described as someone able to abandon his own humanity, but following Flock's betrayal, it'd be hard for Evan to suppress his true emotions. After everything he and Levi have been through, he just never would have expected humanity's strongest soldier to die at the hands of another scout. What makes it worse is that a year earlier, they were the ones who trusted Flock to be the one to eat Reiner. So for him to now stab them in the back with that same power that they allowed him to have, it'd be super unexpected. In a situation like this, it wouldn't take long for his feelings of sadness and confusion to turn into blinding rage as he reaches out to crush the armor titan. Although Flock would be insanely outmatched, he'd still at least raise his fist to defend himself, and just as Urban is about to deal the finishing blow, he suddenly feel a hand on his shoulder. The hand in question would belong to Eren, who'd politely tell the commander not to worry about Flock, since he already has his own idea for what he wants to do with him. Surprised, Ervin would quickly realize that whatever's happening here must be one of the Founding Titan's tricks, because as he glances around, he'd notice that they're frozen in time. Literally nothing except himself and Eren would be able to move inside this dimension, and as the commander looks down, he'd see an old memory of Captain Levi. I probably don't need to explain that this specific memory is from five years ago, when Levi had to decide who would inherit the Colossal Titan. At the time, Mikasa and Eren quite literally fought for Armin to be the one chosen, whereas everyone else seemed to think that Eren was the most logical choice. However, in the present day, Eren would now believe that regardless of who was saved, neither Armin or Eren would have been able to stop the rumbling. 
The real truth is that as long as subjects of Ymir can become titans at any time, then the rest of humanity will fear them for being monsters. That fear is one of the main reasons why it's so difficult for Eldians and humans to coexist, but until recently, Eren had deluded himself into thinking that Irvin might find a way. Sadly, even the best leader and the best plan wasn't able to find a peaceful solution, and so Eldia's only remaining option is to either destroy humanity or wait for humanity to destroy them. In response, the commander would hesitantly admit that Eren might be right, although there's a reason why he still wouldn't be happy about the rumbling. From his perspective, even if this worldwide massacre succeeds, it's hard to justify sacrificing billions of people for the freedom of their one tiny island. After thinking for a while, he'd remind Eren that when Karl Friss originally trapped Eldians behind the walls, it wasn't only their freedom that he took away. The reality is that subjects of Ymir across the sea also lost their freedom as well, and if it wasn't for their sacrifices, Eren never would have made it this far. For example, people like Grisha, Dinah and Kruger were all from Liberio, and it was thanks to their actions that Eldians on the island had the tools to survive. Continuing this train of thought, the commander would suggest that subjects of Ymir born outside the walls are no different from them, and so if Eren truly wants Eldians to be free, then that freedom should be extended to Eldians worldwide. Of course, Eren would reply by asking how that would even be possible, to which Eren would give him a practical solution. As the rumbling continues to march, the founder can transform all these people into pure titans, who can then join him on his rampage across the globe. Once it's all over, they can then start brand new lives on Paradise. but at first, Eren would be majorly skeptical about this plan, given that many Eldians across the sea will hate him for destroying the planet. I think Eren would also have to acknowledge that possibility, but while it's true that some people won't be happy, there are thousands more who will be grateful that their families weren't trampled. A proposal like this would be a lot for Eren to process, but after thinking back to his dad's memories, he would accept that maybe the commander has a point. It can't be denied that Eldians from across the sea laid the foundation for everything Eren has achieved, and so for him to turn around and kill people just like them, it would make him no better than the Marlians. For that reason alone, he'd agree to play along with Eren's plan, on the condition that he takes Mikas' body back home and gives her a proper burial next to Armin. And as the two of them shake hands on it, the scene would flash back to Liberia. On the streets, people would be freaking out as their skin begins to glow yellow, and from Gabi and Falco's perspective, they'd probably think they're about to die. Across the town, thousands of lights would then erupt out of nowhere, as every last man, woman and child would be transformed into a mindless colossal titan. Standing at 60 meters tall, their explosive transformations would destroy what was left of the city, and interestingly, this same thing would be happening all over the world. In every country where internment zones exist, the Eldians there would unexpectedly turn titan and would join the rumbling as they trample everything surrounding them. At the same time while all of this is going on, the attack titan would briefly switch his attention to Flock. In the past, we've seen how the people who've betrayed Eren have usually ended up being killed by someone else, but in this instance he'd want to personally deal with the armor titan. Having already mentally tortured the guy for weeks, I guess the only thing left to do now would be to physically tear him apart in the real world. To accomplish this, Eren would use the founder to forcibly transform Flock back into his human form, before tossing the body into his own gigantic mouth. As Eren's teeth then rip his former friend to pieces, Flock's screams would be heard for miles as the rumbling continues to move forward. Both the Wall Titans and the Interment Zone Titans would keep marching through the ruins of Liberio, but despite their incredible speed, it would still take them 5 more days for the rumbling to be completed. With the exception of Eldia, every last corner of the earth would be flattened until all that remains would be a barren wasteland filled with the remnants of humanity. Billions of people, entire civilizations, and entire cultures would all be wiped out in less than a week, and this disproportionate act of violence is something that Eren was selfishly willing to do to protect the handful of people he has left. By the time he then arrives near the shores of the island, Eren would already be there waiting for him, having made preparations for the internment zone refugees. A few days earlier, in front of a packed courtroom, the commander would explain how Eldia's population has significantly declined during the past decade due to war, famine, and titan-related incidents. Therefore, the arrival of subjects of Ymir from across the sea could be a great opportunity, especially due to their knowledge of the modern world. Their knowledge of modern medicine and technology could help fill the gap left behind by Hizru, and it would allow the island to keep advancing for generations to come. Despite that, many people would still be unsure about the large influx of foreigners, including Premier Zachary who wouldn't really know what to do. Way earlier in this timeline, you might remember that in part 3, Zachary announced his retirement, with Irvin being selected to replace him at the end of the year. Although the year wouldn't be over, we need to remember that number 1, this character has already fulfilled his main goal as commander in chief, 
And number two, it'd be clear from Irvin's speech that he has a clear vision for how to integrate the refugees. For those reasons, I think Zachary would pretty much have to do the sensible thing and retire early, allowing Premier Smith to have final say on how society moves forward after the rumbling. Flashing forward 18 months, I think a ton of things would have changed on the island by now, especially in the capital city. In the underground, a giant monument to Captain Levi would nearly be completed, with Irvin personally overseeing the construction. For decades, the people of the underground have almost been completely ignored by the world government, which is partly why the crime there was allowed to get so out of control. Levi himself was a well-known criminal before he joined the scouts, and if he'd never met Irvin, then it's likely he would have wasted his potential. For that reason, the Commander-in-Chief would want to make sure that people down here have access to better opportunities, which is why, in addition to the statue, the government would make large investments to improve infrastructure and provide various educational programs. Meanwhile, in another area of the capital, Willy Tiber would be locked up in a brand new cell closer to where his family are living. Because the Tibers have such extensive and valuable knowledge of the modern world and also knowledge of the history of the Eldians, they'd receive a degree of special treatment compared to most refugees. It's how they'd be able to negotiate Willy and Peak being transferred into these better conditions in exchange for the Tibers cooperating with the military. That being said, at this moment there still wouldn't be any chance of them being released from prison, which is why Gabby would genuinely be brainstorming ideas for how to break Peak out of her cell. Later that same evening, Colt would give a passionate speech on behalf of Eldians from across the sea, many of whom would be suffering from intense discrimination. It's a fact that many locals on the island would associate the actions of Marley with the people who were coming from over there, and that association would 100% lead to violence against them. This hostility would be similar to how Eldians used to be treated outside the internment zones in Marley itself, and as Evan and Historia listen to what Cole has to say, they'd realise that the scale of the division is even larger than they first expected. Now, when it comes to how Eren would adapt to this new world, most of his time would be spent in a forest towards the south of the island. To explain how he ended up here, the first thing we should remember is that he is still a human, and the guilt from killing billions of people and the guilt from getting Mikasa dragged into it, it would weigh heavily on his mind. As time went on, it's unavoidable that he'd feel more and more ashamed about his actions, but what would really mess with his head is that he'd be treated like a hero everywhere he goes. On the streets of Eldia, he'd literally be worshipped for wiping out their enemies, and there isn't a single place he'd be able to go without people glorifying what he did. When you combine that with the severe PTSD he'd be suffering from, eventually Eren would get so overwhelmed that he'd isolate himself from the rest of society. For almost a year, no one would have any idea where he was, as he'd be living off the land and he'd only ever leave the forest for one reason. Once or twice a month, he'd make the long journey to Gigantina in order to visit that tree on the hill, because underneath this tree is where both Armin and Mikasa would be buried. Every time he'd see them, he'd come to just apologise and ask for their forgiveness, but by pure chance, on one of his visits, Historia would show up a few minutes after him. Despite the garrison searching for Eren for 11 months, this random meeting would be the first time anyone had seen him since his mental breakdown. More than anything, Historia would just be relieved that he's alive, and she'd explain how worried she's been ever since he disappeared. Eren would respond by telling her that she shouldn't waste her energy on a person like him, especially after what he did to her family specifically. However, she'd just let him know straight away that a lot has changed since that day, and if he's truly sorry, then he'll come back and help them. Confused, Eren would ask what she's even talking about, and this is when she'd tell him about the new crisis on the island. Even within this tiny world, people would rather hold on to the trivial things that used to divide them, rather than embracing the fact that fundamentally they're all the same. Eren would disregard this by saying that he never expected for the rumbling to suddenly make society perfect, and that the main thing he wanted was for Eldians to be able to live their lives without fear of being wiped out. Historia would argue back that the refugees are living in fear of being wiped out every day, and although Eren's doing what he can, the hatred they're facing is only getting more and more intense. Many of Eren's followers and believers are the ones causing the most trouble, and so she'd wonder if maybe he could help change their perspectives if he made a return to society. After a brief pause, he'd explain how he doesn't know if he can, because in his heart he's felt useless ever since the power of the titans disappeared. 18 months earlier, when the rumbling was complete, the founder Ymir vanished that same day along with all titan abilities. Whatever she wanted, whether it was revenge on the world or something else, she left once all her descendants made it to the island. It was partly because of this that Eren slipped into his old mindset where he believed that there was nothing special about him, and that without his powers he had nothing to offer humanity. Surprisingly though, out of nowhere, Historia would suddenly give him a hug, and she just tried to reassure him that what he's saying is completely wrong. 
Even though she majorly disagrees with him when it came to doing the rumbling, she's seen enough to know that his worth as a human was more than just him turning into a titan. Regardless of whether he has the power or not, there are still thousands of people out there who believe in him and who'd probably prefer it if he was the one in charge. That comment would cause Eren to laugh for the first time in over a year, and as he hugs her back, he thank her for what she's been trying to do. Historia would reply by asking if that means he'll come back with her, to which he'd just let her know that he's not ready at this point, but that he'd like to arrange for them to meet at this particular spot again. With that said, that is the end of this alternate timeline in which Evan got the Corsal Titan, and if you've made it this far, then I want to thank you for watching the past 7 videos. I'd appreciate if you guys let me know what were your standout moments from the whole series that you liked the best. I gotta say, for me personally, my top 3 moments were Eren using the Warhammer Titan to its full potential. Um, another thing was Historia summoning Evan to the past dimension. I think that was probably my favourite plot twist in the whole thing. Um, and Flock betraying Mikasa was also pretty cool as well. Anyway, thanks again for sticking around for the 17 months that it's taken me to complete this timeline. And uh, yeah, be sure to subscribe if you want more what-if content like this. Until the next one, peace out.